You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is Black Hollywood Live. Justice is served. Featuring the week's roundup and commentary on legal news. Black Hollywood Live. Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live, Justice is served. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Justice is Served, the show where we give you all of the latest in legal news. I'm your host, Mari Fagel, and joining me today are my lovely co-hosts, Rawa Gebre Ab and Lonnie <laughs> Coombs. So thank you both for joining me. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, first up in case of the week, Lonnie, this is a case that really got a lot of people angry this week. Yeah, this has been uh, in the headlines everywhere. Robert Richards IV otherwise known as part of the DuPont family heir, um, the family that built the chemical empire, and also related to the family that co-founded a very prestigious law firm, Richards, Layton & Finger. Um, he was given eight years of probation for essentially raping, sexually assaulting his three-year-old daughter. Now, the interesting thing is this actually happened back in 2005 when the daughter was three years old. When she was five years old, she went to a family relative and said, this is what my dad's doing to me. I don't like it. I want it to stop. They actually confronted the father, had him arrested. He denied it at first. And then when he failed a polygraph, he said, okay, I did it. He admitted it. He was charged at the time with two counts of second degree rape, which each one of them would have put him in prison, mandatory 10 years each. That's 20 years in prison. But just before the trial, the prosecutor offered a deal where he would be able to plead and get probation. So and no jail time. That's right. At all. <laughs> that would be that would be a possibility. And the prosecutor recommended probation, no jail time. And the judge sentenced him to probation, no jail time. And at the time she handed down the sentence, she made a statement that said uh, she, she did not believe that he would fare well in prison, which of course is what everybody is getting upset about. Now, the interesting thing is none of this was known. No one talked about it until just recently, last month, his wife or ex-wife filed a civil lawsuit against him um, for compensatory damages and punitive damages, um, money essentially, for abusing both their daughter and their son. And it ends up that in 2010, he was giving another um, polygraph and he admitted that he actually believed he had also abused their son when he was 16 months old. No charges have ever been filed on that charge. So there's a lot of outrage, whether it is the prosecutor that messed up here, whether it was the judge, whether it's the system, whether yeah. it's just because that's what happens when somebody's really wealthy. Where do you think the blame lies? Well, that's why I liked this Daily Beast article, because people were so upset with the judge mm -hmm. because the judge said, I don't think he's going to fare well in prison, like you said. And I think it reminded people of a case not too long ago of the um, wealthy teenager who um, got in the car accident and killed people affluenza. in the car accident. And affluenza yeah. was um, kind of this disease. I'm so wealthy that, you know, I just can't go to prison. Yeah. Uh, so I think... People were really angry at the judge, and that's kind of where people were targeting. Mm -hmm. But this Daily Beast article basically says it's not just the judge. It's not just the prosecutor. It is the system as a whole, this justice for hire system. The fact that this wealthy guy was able to hire the best of the best defense team. And, um, you know, there's a lot of conflicts of interest here. Uh, Lonnie, I don't know if you can remind me something with the prosecutor. Uh, the person oh, who was originally yeah. prosecuting him ended up uh, joining his team, I believe. Well, the person who represented him is now the attorney general yeah. in, the, in the state there. The attorney general at the time said, I didn't know anything about this case, which is just ridiculous because when there is a celebrity, someone as high profile as this DuPont heir being prosecuted for a crime, raping their child, you better believe the head of that prosecuting office will know about it. But they're denying any, any knowledge of it. The new AG was his attorney at the time or has been his attorney. Um, so there's all of these 
also sort of subtle allegations. Is there payoffs going on here or were there, you know, okay, we'll now help you get to be elected? You know, the, the political backdoor, sort of the house of cards type um, whisperings of, you know, what goes on behind closed doors in the back rooms. You know, this case is really cringeworthy for the obvious reasons, but, um, and, and I would like to be one of those people and am one of those people that when a child is uh, abused or allegedly abused, uh, you want to jump, jump to the child's defense. It's just a natural instinct for so many of us. But I think as a lawyer, I had to kind of step back and, and take a look at this. And although there were some very concerning things about this case, such as the judge's uh, statement about not faring well in uh, jail. I mean, who does fare well in jail? I certainly <laughs> wouldn't. That's not the purpose, to fare well in jail. I yeah. mean, it's punishment. Right. And uh, I think uh, outside of that statement and, and these other kind of maybe shady uh, associations, there are, there are other issues at play. For example, the child's testimony. I mean, the child uh, brought these accusations, I think, at the age of five. Is five. that correct? And so... Uh, and, and not to say that a child wouldn't be truthful, but I think there are always in these types of cases where a, a child of that age or around that age is making certain accusations, such as the accusations in the Woody Allen, uh, mm -hmm. in the Woody Allen incident uh, with his uh, with his daughter or stepdaughter, and. Um, it's difficult to trust that testimony, and in courts have found that uh, at times, because that testimony can change and children's memories may not be as good as they are, courts do not uh, place a lot of stock in, in in that type of testimony. Also, I mean, there are there are other issues at, at play. Well, yeah, I mean, I I was a prosecutor. I prosecuted these mm -hmm. cases. I know there's always issues when you put on children, but I put on a five-year-old and a seven-year-old to testify in a murder case against their father that when they saw their mother being killed when they were three and five, and they were able to testify. But, you know, I think there's, there's always issues when you have any type of sexual case because it's a he said, she said. Right. And when the, you know, victim accuser is that young, that's difficult. There is something to be said. I mean, I think that in certain cases when it's a really complex case that you know the best defense you know can be bought essentially not that they're better attorneys but because they are paid so much money they can focus solely on one case as opposed to a public defender who has to do so many cases because there's great public defenders out there um, but I think what really is getting people upset in this case is the judge if it was based on problems with the case, not wanting to put the victim through searing cross-examination, whatever it is, that's what she should have put on the record. This is the reason why. And the prosecutor should have too. The prosecutor said, look, this is a huge sweetheart deal we're offering the defense, and here's the reason why. Yeah. We don't want to put the victim through this. We have problems, you know, she's changed her story, or whatever it was, as opposed to the judge just getting up there and saying, hey, you know, <laughs> I don't think you're going to do so well in jail, so right. let's just put you in a, in a rehab program, essentially, because we all know that child molesters have a very high recidivism rate. I mean, you know, the rehab is very difficult for them. And then when he comes up, you know, years later and says, yeah, I think I did it to my son, too, when he was 16 months old. I mean, this guy should not be around children. And yet he's just living in his, you know, $1.6 million mansion, living out his life. So I think that raises everyone's concerns, and rightfully so, as members of society, you would want to know if that person was there around your children. I, I don't think he's necessarily, you know, well, you said that they should have put the reason on the record. Mm -hmm. I think they did put their reason on the record. Well, I think their reason really was yeah. that this is a wealthy guy and they were being honest. And then there was all this backlash. And that's when they decide to step back and yeah. say, hey, actually, the, really re the real reason is it's a very complex case. It's hard to trust children in these scenarios. Yeah. Um, I don't think that was the reason. I think they're saying that now. And you brought that up, but I was thinking to myself, if this was not, you know, the son or the heir to a very wealthy estate, the biggest in the state of Delaware, uh, would this result have happened? Would it have been a different result if it was someone else? And I want to read a quote from uh, the Daily Beast article. It says... If Richards were a less enfranchised American, say 33-year-old African-American woman Marissa Alexander facing 60 years in prison for waving a gun at her abusive husband, or Cece McDonald, a transgender African-American woman who pled down not to probation but to 41 months in prison for defending herself against a transphobic and racist attacker, things would have turned out differently. Mm -hmm. And I think, to, in my mind, that hits the nail on the head. I think the reasons are not, oh, it was a child and it's hard to trust, oh, this is a complex 
Sussex case, I think the reason was this is a wealthy man who paid his way out of prison. All right. Well, and and even closer to the cases of the facts of this case, I mean, child molesters don't get probation. It just doesn't happen. It, you know, regardless of the difficulties of the case, they're usually given some type of jail time. That's the standard, you know, sort of sentence for that. I mean, it's one of the cases that people take very seriously, prosecutors take very seriously, and they don't want those molesters to just be out there where they can get, you know, other victims. So I agree that it's, it's, it's out of the norm, and if that is exactly the reason, which I think you're probably right, that the judge was speaking her mind right off the bat, we need to really look at these judges who for some reason have gotten this mindset recently, whether it's a wealthy client or not, that, hey, certain people shouldn't go to prison because they're just not fit for it. I mean, since when has that been a reason? Th then nobody should go to prison. Because <laughs> prison isn't a good thing for anybody. It's a punishment. That's why we have it there. So I don't know if that's a recent mindset, but it's definitely one that we're seeing well, we're hearing reoccurring about right, yeah. Yeah, due to uh, this 24-hour news cycle. Well, I think it's good that we're actually talking about this because I think this has been going on for a while, right. the biases that judges in the system have towards people of certain race, of certain wealth, mm -hmm. of certain status, and now we're talking about it. Yeah, <laughs> and they're getting called on it, which is good because that will keep, you know, there's nothing better than, you know, society watching you to keep people kind of thinking about, hey, maybe I better be careful on this. And to keep judges on their toes. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into On the Docket. We have several stories to cover this week, starting with our favorite topic, our <laughs> most frequent topic, <laughs> Chris Brown. Aww, poor Chris Brown. <laughs> uh, I don't know about poor Chris Brown. I think, he, <laughs> I think he's getting everything he deserves. I'm starting to feel bad for the kid. Oh, oh, man. oh man. And I know, I know. <laughs> so Chris Brown is in federal custody um, because of the case in Washington, D.C. He has two different, he has so many cases going on right yeah. now, but he has two different cases. He obviously was, we reported on him landing back in jail in Los Angeles because he violated uh, the terms of his probation with his rehab. You know, he may have touched women or, you know, gotten upset in his ang anger management counseling, mm -hmm. and he ended up in jail because of that. Now federal authorities will transport him to D.C. for pretrial hearings in his assault case. The assault case, if you guys remember, is the photobombing incident mm -hmm. where someone photobombed a picture of him and he decided to beat the crap out of that person. Right. So now he is, he was transported to D.C. Mark Yergos, his attorney, is not happy about the way he was transported because he wanted to take him himself because he claims the transfer into U.S. Marshal custody will inhibit him from conferring with Brown prior to the trial. Uh, the judge denied it. He's in federal custody right now. Uh, so, Lonnie, as a prosecutor, what did you <laughs> think about this? Is this a common move? I mean, I guess the situation well, doesn't really happen that often right. with cases across state lines. No, but what I liked is that I'm seeing him being treated more like everybody else in the system. I mean, the feds just came in. They put him on a FedCon airplane along with all the other prisoners that are being transported. He didn't have to get a fancy private jet or plane or Mark Garagos driving him himself. He offered to do that. Um, you know, he's he's being put in the system. And that's, you know, he's been on probation now for since 2009. And he has failed the conditions of his probation over and over and over again. And I'll tell you, at the time that he got probation, that was a huge gift. And probation is a second chance for people. And they're given all those conditions because the judge wants them to follow those conditions turn their life around and maybe work their way out of the system and get back to normal life. But Chris Brown is essentially thumbed his nose at all of that, continued to get into trouble and failed to do his conditions. You know, he was given community service and he asked for special consideration to do it in a different state. And they got the police chief in that state to stand and say, I'll take, you know, um, responsibility for this. They turned in proof that they did it. Well, they found out the whole thing was a fraud, that he had not done it. The police chief got in trouble and Chris Brown's like, oh, oh, really? You know, and so he just doesn't seem to be able to follow the rules like everybody else. So the feds are saying, hey, you know what? You want special treatment? No, we don't care about that. He's going to come back. He's going to have to face the charges here. Um, it looks like the judge here 
is keeping him in jail for failing to follow the rules at the rehab. So maybe if he's in jail and they keep him in jail for a while, that he'll start to have to follow the rules, which, you know, essentially is the thing that turns people around is when they hit that bottom where they can't anymore play the games they're used to playing. Then they can't, hopefully they wake up and they say, oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to have to change. So um, I'm hoping that this will be a wake up call for him. But I, I'm glad to see that at least the system is not giving him any more breaks, that they're just letting him go along like everybody else that's doing the same thing he's doing. So, Rawa, do you feel bad for Breezy then? I do. I do. And although I do agree with you, Lonnie, with, uh, you know, as to the fact that, you know, he's done these things, he, he has to be punished or he has to answer for, for his actions in some type of way. Jail isn't rehabilitative um, for, for many people. And, and for some, um, yes, it is a wake up call. But for those with deep seated issues, um, and, and from what I understand and from what has been reported, Chris Brown has uh, post traumatic stress disorder. He's been diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. And, and I'm not sure if jail will uh, will help. It may aggravate the situation. And so uh, that's where my concern lies. He has messed up. I will admit that over and over and over again. But uh, I think that uh, I think that he needs a little bit more than jail. My yeah. But if he's been in rehab and he won't follow the yeah. rehab rules, right. then what do you do? You, right. know, you put him in jail until he'll be willing to. I mean, because you have to be willing to accept that rehab, you know, and be open to the treatment and changing. And if you're not, then you know you really have no other choice but to say, okay, we'll give you something a little more serious. Which I understand, which is why a lot of uh, people who go to rehab have to go to rehab over and over mm -hmm. and over again. It's not usually a one-time thing. Uh, my question, actually, with regard to Mark Garagos, his attorney's concern that he won't be able to confer with his client before the case in D.C. or the trial in D.C., is, okay, if he left yesterday and the trial in D.C. is on the 17th, how long does it take for him to fly from San Bernardino, California, <laughs> to BC. I've heard it can take several days, because um, I know there's a lot of times with these types of flights, they stop through Oklahoma where there are a lot of other prisons, and mm -hmm. uh, prisoners are picked up along the way. I don't know, is this like a 13-day flight? I don't, I, I have questions. I, it's you not know, able to confer with him. I mean, that's probably <laughs> why, in my head, why the judge was like, uh, maybe you can confer with him when he gets there. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. Maybe he thinks just having him in federal custody, there's more barriers between them mm -hmm. than having him in his own custody. Uh, but when you were talking about Conair and you're saying, you know, he it could take several days and he's dropped off at all these prison sites, I'm just thinking in my mind about the Nicolas Cage yes, movie Conair yes, and just thinking, yes. what if there was a Conair 2 know. with Chris Brown and like <laughs> what that is like. I wish oh, I was a fly on the wall in that <sighs> point to like see what's going on right now. Yeah, probably <laughs> not pretty. So yeah. uh, moving on to our next case on the docket. Um, as a former journalist, I'm glad that we are having a conversation about this topic. Uh, after the Boston Marathon bombings last April, almost a one-year anniversary now, the different news outlets were so quick to want to be the first one to, you know, accurately say who was the bomber or who were the bombers, that so many of them got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so many of them engaged in certain racial profiling and biases, and now they are facing the consequences. One is Glenn Beck uh, is being sued for defamation. Uh, a 20 year old Saudi Arabian man who was a student in Boston, who was at the marathon, who was injured by the bombing. Glenn Beck tried to claim that he was the bomber. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's facing mm -hmm. a lawsuit. Uh, similarly, the, um, the New York Post ran a cover story. I don't know if you guys remember this. The picture on the cover, and it said bag men, and tried to claim that these two men in the photo were the bombers. And again, they were people who were just standing at the marathon and were injured. And they filed uh, a libel suit, and the New York Post tried to dismiss it, and the judge wouldn't allow him to dismiss it. And... You know, this isn't the first time with the Boston Marathon that we've seen this inaccurate reporting in this 24-hour news cycle of trying to jump on and be the first to report the news. I mean, with the Newtown shooting, uh, Adam Lanza, the shooter, was wearing, had his brother's ID, mm -hmm. and they reported the wrong name at first. They yeah. reported Ryan Lanza, his brother's name. We keep seeing this happen over and over again, uh, and I don't know if 
enough defamation and libel suits is the answer to try to fix this, but something needs to be done in my mind. So Rawa, I want to ask you first, uh, you know, working in civil law, what's the likelihood of the success of these cases in this scenario? Because these people are not high profile celebrities, because when there's someone who is a politician, a celebrity, someone high profile in nature, there's a much higher standard because they're already have subjected themselves to the public eye. It's much more difficult for them to win a case like this against the media for false reporting. Uh, but these people are not high profile. So right. I, in my mind, I think they have better chances in that it's a lower standard. I completely agree. Uh, defamation, essentially, I mean, there, there are a few... Uh, requirements to to qualify uh, that the that the information is is published that the information is false that it's injurious and that is um, causes injury and and that it's uh, unprivileged meaning if it's privileged uh, a privileged uh, discussion that's or testimony that's taking place on the stand that's privileged but if it's just happening on a talk show for example um, it is unprivileged so I, I think that uh, Glenn Beck's characterization of this young man is um, is possibly going to land him in some trouble. And I, I think, like many defamation lawsuits, it will likely settle out of court. I mean, Glenn Beck, I think he was quoted as saying, um, this guy is the money man. He's the yeah. guy who's paid for it. Um, and I quote, let me send this message. Let me be very clear. We know who this Saudi national is. We know who this man is. And listen to me very carefully. We know he, he's a bad, bad man. And This quote. is someone trying <laughs> to get an education mm -hmm. who was there and who was injured right. himself. Mm -hmm. How horrendous. <laughs> yeah, and we're seeing a lot of this more and more and I don't know if defamation lawsuits are going to I mean they're going to continue to rise I don't know if I mean maybe if the stakes grow higher and higher but uh, if, if the cost of uh, defam defamation lawsuits maybe outweighs mm -hmm. the initial cost of reporting and getting that initial scoop however wrong it may be then then maybe there this will be affected but I think that we're going to see a lot of this for uh, for the times to come. And uh, I mean for example in the Malaysian Airlines uh, incident yeah. flight 370 I mean all of a sudden, these uh, these air um, everybody on the airline and these pilots were are they terrorists? Are they not terrorists? Oh, there's a flight simulator. Are I the mean, people with the stolen passports terrorists? Exactly. That's, that's so common to have yeah. stolen passports. They they were just trying to get out of Asylum, their country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was thinking with the Malaysian airline the same thing. I mean, they talked about that pilot having connections, uh, you know, and and him being a hijacker for so long without the information to back it up. Well, yeah. now they're coming back to him too. Yeah. You know, this reminded me of you guys are probably too young, but in 1996, <laughs> the Olympics, Richard Jewell, right. they had the bombing in the Centennial Park, and he was the security guard who actually saw the bomb, cleared people out, saved people's lives. Yeah. At first he was a hero, and then quickly the media turned on him, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. he became a suspect, and his life was ruined from that. Um, I, I agree. I think that, and I'm glad to see that the court said that these um, cases can go forward. I think that it comes down to money. For all of these you know, news stations and news outlets, it comes down to money. They get this information, and then there's the, you know, the brain trust in there. Okay, do we run with it? Is that enough information? Do we have enough um, sources to confirm it? Because we want to be the first. Because if we don't do it, then the other right. station will do it. and Or they'll be the station that does it. And we don't want to be the last ones that are dragging our feet. So they have this constant dilemma of and the pressure of being the first and being the one that has the most information. But you have to be careful. These are people's lives. Mm -hmm. People who are students. People who might be a wonderful you know, pilot and family man. We just don't know. Uh, you know. And you just see people sometimes saying allegedly. They remember to say allegedly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll also hear the, the reporter or the anchor saying, now we don't know yet, but this is some information. You know, At least couching it in some terms. So that it, but then Glenn Beck and, and people like that who just you know, go full force and start to really smear these people's lives and reputations. I really think that, that there has to be um, something done. And as you said, it has to be strong enough to outweigh whatever right. benefit they get from playing reckless with this information. What's strong enough is people not watching and the ratings going down and the ad dollars going down. And I honestly think that uh, the viewing public loses respect mm -hmm. when these stories are so misreported. And then they change the channel to a station that they trust. So I Absolutely. think in my mind, yeah. defamation suits and libel suits, you know, can make a difference, but they can only go so far. It's people, it's the viewing public and their choices. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to our third story. <laughs> I brought up this story this week because I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. People 
who brag about their illegal <laughs> criminal activities on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on social media. Uh, the, the story I'm about to report is just one of many I have read. Okay, so this Michigan woman, she's not allowed to drink uh, as a condition of her probation for 2012 drunk driving. Yet she posted on Facebook, she boasted about her quote unquote achievement. What was this achievement? Quote, buzz killer for me, I had to breathalyze this morning and I drank yesterday, but I passed. Thank God, LOL. Well, guess what? <laughs> Everyone can read that. Yeah. That's just because you put it on Facebook doesn't somehow make it so that... Anonymous. Anonymous, <laughs> yeah. So um, she's due in court. She could face up to 93 days in jail. And um, wh what lessons can we teach these people? Like... Don't post these things on the internet. Lonnie, I, as a prosecutor, I, did, did you ever see this? I mean, social media has just been getting really out of control recently yeah. in the last few years. Yeah. But did you ever see this, this bragging? Well, yeah, and before the social media, a lot of times gang members, when, you know, uh, they would take pictures of themselves with their with their guns and their stolen property and throwing their gang signs with their buddies. And a lot of times police officers would use those photographs that were in their cameras or, you know, laying around their home to piece together information to put together an investigation. You know, it, it's interesting. People don't realize that um, a lot of people go on to social media, not just the people posting, and law enforcement has gotten smart. And right. they have been trolling, I shouldn't say trolling, they've been watching the internet and watch and looking for information for a long time now and using it to their advantage. They're, um, in my area, I really th think this is clever that um, law enforcement goes on to high school kids' websites and find posts and says, hey, party, this, you know, underage drinking. And then they go and bust up these parties. They know where they are because the kids are posting about them. And then and they sometimes tweet, they say, hey, parents, we're finding out this information. You should be, too. You should be finding out this information before us and shutting down these parties before we get there and arrest your kids. So um, I, I think it's a great investigative tool. Uh, hey, if you're stupid enough to post it, I think you're that, great. It just helps the um, law enforcement that much more to be able to, you know, investigate and prosecute these crimes. I mean, this reminds me of the Steubenville rape case right. where so much of the mm -hmm. evidence was the photos of her naked, uh, the text between the people talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, in my mind, this is a tool for prosecutors, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think the immediate uh, lessons here are, one, don't po uh, post on Facebook about somehow evading the results of your breathalyzer mm -hmm. test and um, make sure you spell breathalyzer correct if you're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the overall lesson here is really that hubris is is always punished and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of young people it's not just young people I mean I mean it's people of all ages oh, I've yeah. seen this and especially you know even when lawsuits are filed and, and attorneys have to do uh, investigations into the plaintiff or investigations into the defendant. I mean, social media is the first place people look for evidence. And mm -hmm. you would be so surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be, uh, to see what kind of incriminating things people put on their uh, yeah. social media profile and not even think twice about it. Because I think they think, oh, my privacy settings are so that only my friends can see. Right. And so I can just say whatever I want. Or I can delete it. This yeah. stuff never goes away. Yeah. I mean, you, and law enforcement has some sophisticated ways to, you know, look into this stuff and, and get into the Internet. So pay off your friends. Yeah. I mean, hey. Watch House <laughs> of Cards. <Yeah. laughs> to see. Uh, <laughs> not giving anything away. No spoilers. Okay. So uh, final story on the docket. One day after Ray Rice is indicted on <laughs> aggravated assault charges for allegedly punching and knocking his girlfriend out the couple ties the knot they get married so either this was a quick change of heart on her point or there is some sort of legal maneuver behind this uh, because the wedding is coming in the middle of the couple's domestic violence issues some may think it is a legal maneuver so that she can't testify against him but uh something interesting in new jersey marital privilege does not apply in domestic violence cases where one spouse is the victim um so married or not the law would require her to testify against him if she's called upon so did he not realize this or do you think this is really some sort of change of heart they wanted to get married and they're not even thinking about it uh uh, Rob, what do you think? It is really 
in general, it's difficult to speak with absolute certainty to people's motivations for the reasons, you know, the reasons why they do what they do. But in this case, uh, Ray Rice was indicted by a, a New Jersey grand jury, and then the next day he got married. Okay, <laughs> granted, he'd been engaged for a while, and allegedly the wedding had been planned for a few weeks. But a few weeks. A few weeks. Yeah. But the, I mean, the, the convenience of it all was just, I mean, it was just mind-boggling. True, in New Jersey, marital privilege uh, won't necessarily have the uh, the effect that one would think it would have in, in, in other states, but uh, if his fiance now wife, decides that she doesn't want to cooperate, even if she is compelled to testify, then they really don't have much of a case. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's video of Ray <laughs> Rice uh, dragging his unconscious wife, yeah. now wife, out of an elevator, and there is uh, purportedly information, or a video, of him knocking her out, knocking her unconscious. I mean, we haven't seen that as the public. We've only seen the video of him dragging her out of the, um, out of the elevator, but the, if there's no sound, if there's no audio, a good defense attorney can spin that into anything, and especially if she decides she doesn't want to cooperate. So, um, I mean, it's 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 mind boggling. I think it's also going to trying to negotiate a deal with the prosecutor. Hey, look, you know, they're back together. They're married. They have a child. Do you really want to ruin this family by taking the father away, putting him in jail? But this is a very serious case. I mean, this is not just like a, hey, a shove. I mean, she was knocked out, allegedly, and you see the, the ramifications of that. You know, I hope that someone is helping her, counseling her or something, because uh, it doesn't usually just stop after the first time. Um, so I, I think that they're doing this, realizing that she may get called, but like you said, she can change her story on the stand. She can, you know, get up there and really just try to thwart the prosecutor by saying what a wonderful person he is and now it was all her fault and it was a mistake. So just getting her on the stand doesn't win the battle for you. You do have these videotapes though, yeah. but because of these issues, the prosecutor will probably mm -hmm. be more open to negotiating some type of disposition rather than it going to trial, which is probably what he wants to do is just get this out of the public eye. And I'm fairly certain he won't face any jail time. I mean, he's a first time offender. New Jersey has a first time offender program. He doesn't, to my knowledge, have a, a criminal past and, and, and or criminal record and because of that it's very unlikely he'll face jail time but if convicted he does face three to five years in prison mm -hmm. but yeah it, it's probably unlikely and I do agree with you mm -hmm. guys the maneuvering behind it uh, this is similar reminds me we talked about a story in the past on this show Aaron Hernandez mm -hmm. and his girlfriend yeah. uh, and their plans to get married kind of before the trial because then she can assert marital privilege because she knows so much about that alleged murder uh, and so I think there is a lot of maneuvering when it comes to to this uh, so we'll definitely keep posted on this story and uh, provide you guys with updates. Absolutely. Uh, I guess this brings us to the last part of the show, tipping the <laughs> scales. Um, okay, I just kind of want to rub my temples beforehand because <laughs> This topic is sure to get uh, to sure to get us going. Um, I guess the question <laughs> the question that I have here is: Is it that do women attorneys need to stop dressing so sexy? Do they need to start dressing more conservatively, or is the profession unnecessarily hard on women? I think this comes uh, this comes from an article uh, that was published uh, regarding female lawyers who dress too sexy, apparently being a huge problem in the courtroom. And w what followed from that was a response uh, in a blog from a federal judge, U.S. District Judge Richard Kopp, who has a blog uh, discussing a female attorney in his courtroom uh, who is very well-spoken, very uh, well-read, a great litigator, a great arguer, um, uh, but she she dresses uh, in outfits that show some cleavage, maybe show some leg, and so he uh, discusses how that's pretty distracting and how female clerks and other females who work in uh, female uh, employees of the courtrooms have been uh, frustrated and angered by young women who come into the courtroom dressed like that, especially young women attorneys. And um, and he goes on this uh, tirade or, or rant about, um, about young women lawyers stating three interesting and what he believes to be salient points. Uh, one, you can't win. Men are, are pigs and prudes. Women have to get over it. Uh, he, he also states it, it's not about the female attorneys, and that goes double when you're appearing in front of a jury. Uh, these female attorneys need to be very conscious about what they're wearing uh, in order not to unduly influence their cases. And, um, and three, 
uh, he makes the point that, <clears throat> that female attorneys need to think about female law clerks and if they're going to label you, uh, and I quote, like an ignorant slut, end quote, behind your back. If you feel like that's going to be uh, their characterization of you, then you need to tone it down. I'm horrified. I'm horrified. I'm horrified by this article, and I'd really love to know your thoughts about it. I don't know what's worse. The fact that Judge Kopp in this blog uh, regarding female dress in the courtroom, well, the fact that female dress in the courtroom is even really an issue because a, a lot of female attorneys most know how to come before the court professionally. Uh, but the first, a member of the federal judiciary referring to himself as a dirty old man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Two, you know, two, I mean, uh, uh, Discussing this woman, this this specific woman, and and how he he finds her incredibly attractive, and how he finds her her cleavage to be one of her strongest attributes, or or three, suggesting that uh, those who don't meet his appearance standard in his court will not only be objectified, but will be completely hated by other other women in the court. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, well, I want to talk about where this all stems from <laughs> because I've been following this particular story for a while because uh, it all started when Loyola Law School sent out an email to its students and said, quote, I really don't need to mention that cleavage and stiletto heels are not appropriate office wear outside of ridiculous lawyer TV shows, do I? Yet I'm getting complaints from supervisors. My fiance goes to Loyola, so I know a little bit about what's been going on oh here. God. Okay, so one of the students has a part time externship or full time externship with a judge this semester. She had to like run out for an, an appointment, so she put on her flip flops and happened to run into the. So she normally wears heels. She put on her flip flops to run to her car to run to this appointment. She happened to run into the judge when she was running down. The judge saw it, didn't like it, and sent an email to Loyola. So this is where it all started from. So it wasn't. It was. It was a. It wasn't even a sexy thing. It was more of comfort. Yeah, and, and then someone walk. with yeah. the cleavage. I think that was another incident but it was like you know so then this email that Loyola sent out got picked up and Slate wrote about it and then this judge wrote in his response to the Slate article the Slate article was very much in line with what you're saying right. um, I, I I think that you're right it's he's disrespecting his position by calling himself a dirty old man. I don't think that federal judges should have blogs <laughs> in the first place, let alone blogs where they title their post on being a dirty old man and how young women lawyers dress. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I think that some some things are, are a little bit outdated. I mean, in federal court, in some federal courtrooms, judges still require women to wear skirt suits. Mm -hmm. They oh, don't like too. it. <laughs> yeah, they don't like when they wear pants suits. Mm -hmm. So it's like a no-win situation. So you're telling me you can't wear a pants suit because that's too manly, but you can't show a little bit of your chest or, you know, dress in some form that they, they deem inappropriate because that's too female. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a no-win situation in my mind. So, Lonnie, I want to get your opinion on this, and then I want to read some opinions on Twitter because I asked our viewers this week what they think about this, and, you know, there's some interesting reactions. <laughs> you know, I, I was a trial lawyer for 18 years, so I was in the courtroom every day. And this was, you know, during a time where these styles were really evolving. I mean, it went from, it was during the time where uh, women lawyers started to wear more pants. And I remember I heard women next to me in the stall in the bathroom discussing the fact that they could see my legs. I was not wearing pantyhose. And that was a big move that, you know, oh my goodness, she's the one that wears bare legs into the courtroom. Um, so it's been a lot of change and it's been not just the judges who, you know, and let's face it, there's still a lot of, you know, old school male judges on the bench, but also, you know, supervisors who are still most, you know, more male than female and then other women who, you know, will, will comment on it. Um, I have some some mixed feelings on it because I do agree with the one thing that the judge said and it's, it's not about you. I believe that if you're an attorney, you are taking on the mantle of you, someone who you want to have garner respect um, and trustworthiness from other people. So you need to present yourself that way in the courtroom, um, in front of the jury. I would do things like 
uh, make sure that during the before my closing arguments, my hands, my nails were done because I was going to be talking to the. I didn't want them to be distracted by like messy nails. If I was um, going to be cross-examining a defendant, I would wear red to get up in his face. I mean, I would use my appearance to be more effective as an advocate, which is what I was there for. I was not there to be a fashion piece. I was not there to, you know, try out the latest trends. I was there to be an advocate. I took that, you know, very seriously, and I wanted to be a professional. That didn't mean that I had to be, you know, wearing, you know, the you know, extremely conservative outfits. I wore what I thought would um, be most effective in the situation that I was in that day. So I think that and that one point that he made that it's not about you, it's about what you're doing and what you're trying to project. I think that's something that um, female and male attorneys should really consider um, as far as what's going to not be distracting but also present me in a professional way, sometimes you do want to distract. Sometimes you want to throw your opponent off. You want to throw the defendant off. Um, and so you can use that to, to an effect too. So um, I think that, you know, there is a line of too sexy. I'm just going to say it in the courtroom because I think that the courtroom is a place where you still want to have decorum and respect for the process. And you, if you want uh, people who are going through that system to have respect for the process, that there is a certain standard that you want to project. So, um, you know, short of going, everyone going to the robes and the, you know, white <laughs> wigs, which I think would be horrible, but they still do that in some places too. I, I just think that people should be a little more mindful of what they're there for and that they're an advocate as opposed to, you know, other professions where you can be more creative and more artistic or more fashionable. I'm not saying that you can't be feminine and attractive and sexy, but just, you know, remember what you're there to do. It's interesting that you say that you can sometimes use it to your advantage, you know, mm -hmm. you wearing red to kind of throw someone, yeah. uh, throw an opposing witness off or, you know, having your nails done. What do you think about uh, a Fox News host this week saying that he thinks that women can and should use their sexuality to their advantage in the courtroom? Well, it, depending on how that translates, I, I you know, I don't know. I guess I don't know what he means by that. I would have. To, I would need more details. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't just mean wearing red shirts or having nails. Yeah. He meant using your sexuality and the cleavage to your advantage. I'm really. I'm growing very tired of hearing men opine on women's sexuality and dress in the courtroom. I think we, I think my bigger issue, and although I really agree with Lonnie's points about decorum and uh, respect for the court, I, I have a lot of concerns about the emphasis that's being placed on, on women. I mean, where is the talk about the men? I mean, I have been in the courtroom and seen men whose suits haven't seen the dry cleaner since the day it was bought, <laughs> have not even thought to run an iron over their shirts who are you know I, I've seen I've seen it all and uh, and especially especially with older male attorneys and it, it does appear that they are able to get away with a lot more and I mean I think that that's just the way that the world works and how it will probably continue to work for a while but that that emphasis on women as if uh, women are the only problem here uh, is concerning yeah, no, I think it needs to go for both, and I agree. Right. There's not as wide variety for the men, but there's still a level that the men, you know, the certain crazy ties or, you know, um, different s styles. I think that, that both sides should be mindful of that. And, you know, the, the thing about using their sexuality that the, the Fox host said, you have to be careful because you never know how it's being perceived. Yeah. Right. So... Yeah, and that's why I do agree with his one point, this judge, if he's going to write a blog about this, <laughs> uh, the one point I do agree with that it's not about you, uh, you know, it's about the jury and the case and uh, defend, you know, a and being an advocate for your client. Uh, the only thing I don't like is outdated standards like telling women that you should wear skirt suits and pantyhose. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that pantsuits are completely fine and appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, showing chest is you're starting to get to an inappropriate line, but I don't like those double standards of a woman can't, a woman can't wear a pantsuit as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to read some of the tweets that we got this week. Uh, Chastity Elizabeth says, we could do without hot pants and cleavage, especially when in the courthouse and in hearings. I guess where I'm from, it's all right. Uh, Robin Lynn says, just because a woman dresses a certain way does not make her a slut. Having said that, I think some women dress too provocatively for court and should remember that they can dress professionally yet stylish. My firm 
everyone has a dress code, professional entire, uh, no low cut shirts, no super short skirt that barely cover your butt. The women in my firm look professional and my clients respect that. Uh, and Helen, uh, Wydekin says there are certain venues where professional dress should be automatic. Do you want to be taken seriously or not? Well, and then one lady brought, or whoever it was, brought up a good point about the clients respected. When your client is coming to court with you, you tell them dress appropriately. Right. You don't want yeah. them coming in with the short skirts or the you know tube top. So as the advocate, you need to take that to heart too. Yeah. All right. Well, that looks like. Uh that was our show today. Great topics. It was great hosting with you ladies again this week. Tweet us your opinions, everyone, uh, at Rawa. At Mari Fagel. At Lonnie Coombs. And uh, we will see you all next Friday. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Same time, same place, and have a great weekend. From producers Maria Menunos, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire BHL crew, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I'm your BHL announcer, Scipio. Instagram me at Planet Scipio. Thank you for tuning in. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals. Thanks for watching Black Hollywood Live on YouTube. For more in depth interviews and news, subscribe to our channel here and be sure to share your opinion in the comment section below here. See you soon, everyone. Bye.